This is out of the New King James. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. For our question and answer tonight, I hope that you brought your Bibles because we always seek to provide a Bible answer for every question that's asked in this forum. And I'm delighted to report that we have more questions than we're going to be able to get to tonight. That's a good problem to have. And so if I don't get to your question tonight, then please know I'm not trying to avoid it, but we will get to it next time. We just have a limited amount of time. But let me use just a moment of that time to reiterate the urgency of our gospel meeting that's coming up two weeks from today and to mention that Brother Parker, who is an excellent preacher, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to hear him before, but we are glad to be having him come and I would encourage you to maybe search for him on YouTube and find one or two of his lessons to listen to as a way of getting excited about the gospel meeting that we have coming up. It's going to be excellent. And so if you want to get a foretaste of what we're going to enjoy, then go. I know I've done it recently where you can go and find lessons that he's done elsewhere. And so I say that because when we go out to do the hanging of the materials on people's doors, you are inviting them to an event that is really going to be a good event. And so we should feel very gratified that we have such an event with which we can appeal to our community and say, come and hear the gospel preached, because it will be preached in an effective way. And we look forward to that. Okay, the first question we have tonight is, I have always used B.C. and A.D. to delineate time. If B.C.E. is being used in order to take Christ out, to be more politically correct, but is equivalent to the meaning of B.C., that is, the B.C. years are the same as the BCE years and the AD years are the same as the CE years, then shouldn't Christians continue to choose BC so as to not be negating Christ or bowing to more palatable vernacular? Now these terms are interchangeable as far as marking years. Here is why I tend, I will tend to use BCE and CE as opposed to B.C. and A.D. You remember that B.C. stands for before Christ, and A.D. stands for Anno Domini, which is the year of our Lord in Latin. There's not a real comfortable way for Christians to approach this issue, because where I would certainly like to use the idea of the birth of Christ separating one epoch of history from another, and I would certainly like to bring up Jesus in delineating various periods of history, Nonetheless, the BCAD designation is misleading for this simple and sad historical reason. In the 6th century, there was a Syrian monk who miscalculated the date of Herod the Great's death. That's the reason. That, when you look at the BCAD, Jesus is born in the BC period. And that's a contradiction. You see, BC means before Christ. But Herod died, think about this, Herod died and in 4 B.C. We're very confident of the date of Herod's death. But you remember Jesus was born and then Herod was angry about this king of the Jews being born and he had the babies killed in Bethlehem in Luke 2. So I don't use B.C., at least when I think of it in my mind. Sometimes I lapse into it. But I don't use it because it has Jesus being born in the before Christ period. So it's just misleading. I'd rather bring up the name of Jesus, but it just becomes confusing to use B.C. and A.D. Let me call your attention to a chart that I have on the next slide. And this chart helps us when we're trying to address the question of when Jesus was born. Because again, my decision to use B.C.E. and C.E. is based on the date of the birth of Jesus. And here is our best estimation as to the year when Jesus was born. He was born probably in the year 4 BCE, maybe 5, but about 4 BCE. And the Bible, of course, does not tell us an exact year, nor does it tell us an exact date. And I'm not even going to get into the issue of the date in in the calendar of Jesus' birth, but I am going to get into the date of the, as far as the year goes, just to that level. 
But Jesus was born before Herod the Great died. That's obvious. And he died in 4 BCE. Jesus was born just after or during the census of Quirinius. And you can read about that census in Luke 2. It's interesting that Luke is the only writer in all of history that mentions this particular census. And some people have said, well, Luke must have been mistaken because we know about a census that Quirinius did in 6 or 7 BCE. I would just suggest that Luke seemed to know when censuses were taken. He mentions one in Acts 5 and verse 37 that was different from the one that he mentions in Luke 2. So Luke seems to be pretty well informed about when censuses happen. So I don't think there's any contradiction. I just think Quirinius did a census that is not recorded anywhere else. That's perfectly plausible. Jesus was born just before Herod killed all the male children in the Bethlehem area, as Matthew 2.16 says. And again, Matthew is the only writer in all of history that denotes this or that records Herod's killing of all these babies. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. Of course it happened. It's just that Matthew happens to be the only one who records it. And it's perfectly consistent with Herod's character. If you do a little study in secular history about the kinds of things that Herod did to people, he was a bad guy. And I won't go into the details of that, but we we did so not long ago in our New Testament world class. And then finally, Jesus was born in time to begin his ministry at about age 30. That's when he began, according to Luke 3.23, while John the Baptist was still ministering, which was uh, recorded in John 3, 22 and 23, that John was preaching and baptizing people at the same time when Jesus and his disciples were also baptizing people. So there was some overlap. John began his ministry in the 15th year of Emperor Tiberius, which puts it either at, depending on what month of the year this began, in between 27 and 29 CE. So that puts the birth of Jesus, given that he began about age 30, during the ministry of John the Baptist, being born exactly when we thought, which was just before the death of Herod the Great in 4 BCE. And I can talk with you later about how the date of Herod's death is determined. If you'd like to get into that, you you can ask another question or just come talk to me personally and I can refer you to the literature. But that's why I go with BCE and CE, because it it negates that confusion brought about about the date of Christ's birth. Okay, next question. Let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 30, and we're going to read beginning in verse 14. The question is, what are mandrakes? What were or are they used for? The answer is, biblically speaking, we're not exactly sure what fruit the mandrake was, because there are a variety of fruits that could be denoted by the Hebrew word translated mandrake. But the word in Hebrew literally means love fruit. And among other things, and many are no doubt superstitious, including a sedative or an anesthetic, mandrakes are a plant that was thought to have aphrodisiac and fertility enhancing properties in many ancient cultures. Mandrakes were thought to do a lot of different things for a person's health. But chief among those things that were thought to be induced by the mandrake were those that I just mentioned. And let's read about this. It's mentioned in two biblical passages. One is Genesis 30. The other is Song of Solomon 7 in verse 13. So we'll read both of those passages. They're both in the context of a man and a woman being married and uh, having the normal arrangement of marriage. Having said that, the Bible does not make any claims. This is very interesting. The Bible does not make any specific claims about what a mandrake would do for somebody. The Bible just mentions that they were used. So let's read beginning in verse 14 of Genesis 30. Now in the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter for you to take my husband? And would you take my son's mandrakes also? So Rachel said, Therefore he may lie with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. We won't go into all the context of the controversy between Rachel and Leah over the rights to the husband, Jacob. But this was a bitter rivalry between these two ladies. And it goes to show 
that when we pervert God's plan for marriage, according to Genesis 2.24, which as the children said, is one man for one woman for life, there are always, always disastrous consequences. And so, here we have this controversy, and they negotiated over who was going to have Jacob in that instance based upon the exchange of these mandrakes, or these love apples, or love fruit. Now, let's look over at Song of Solomon, chapter 7 and verse 13. It says, The mandrakes have given forth fragrance, and over our doors are all choice fruits, both new and old, which I have saved up for you, my beloved. A variety of plants are called mandrakes today. And most people, I guess, suppose that the mandrake in the Bible is in the family Mandragora officinalis, or that's the species name for the mandrake, according to many people. But that's just uncertain. It's speculation. And so if you would like to do some more study about the kinds of fruits that might be discussed in the Bible in this passage, then I can point you to relevant literature about that. Next question. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. We have a couple of questions regarding the church's use of funds. And interestingly, I think both of these were submitted prior to our Bible class this morning when we talked about that very subject. But I don't think we answered every question that might come up about this. And so I, I don't think I'm being redundant when I answer these questions. The first one is this. How do we know that the early church had a common treasury? I really appreciate this question because it shows the person asking the question is wanting to do things that the Bible describes in a biblical, authorized fashion. In other words, the person asking the question says, I see that we have a church treasury, and I see that much of the work that's done by the church is accomplished by the function of the money in that treasury. But then I want to make sure, are we authorized biblically to have one? Colossians 3.17 says that what in word or deed, whatever we do, we must do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or by His authority. So everything we do in the actions we take, that's our deeds, the words that we say, all of that must be authorized by the Bible. And 2 John 9 says, whoever goes beyond and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ has not God. So does the doctrine of Christ authorize the bank account, the use of the church treasury or the common joint fund that contains the monies that the Christians contribute? The answer is yes, and let's read that authorization in 1 Corinthians 16, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. When I arrive, Whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. Notice that Paul says the Christians, each one of them, was to put aside something and save it. Someone might say, well, couldn't that be in their own personal bank account? They put it aside and save it, let's say, in their savings account. Actually, no. Because here what we have is a situation where when Paul gets there... There will be no collecting to be done because it will already all be together. And that demonstrates that the Christians weren't keeping the money in their own house or in their own bank account, whatever the case might have been with that. Rather, there was a joint money bag or money box or collection where the Christians were keeping the money so that it would be prepared for the need when it arose. And the disciples would have been familiar with this type of thing because... Judas was the one who kept the common treasury among the apostles. We read about that in John 12, 6. And also, the Christians in Jerusalem had a similar situation, even if all of the principles from 1 Corinthians 16 had not yet been inculcated in Jerusalem. Remember when the Christians sold their property? What did they do with the proceeds from that property? In Acts 4, beginning in verse 36 and going through chapter 5 and verse 3, They took that money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And that seems to me to be a proto kind of treasury. That principle was already in place in the church at Jerusalem. And Paul says, you need to store up this money so that there be no collections when I come. Hence, a joint bank account, if you will, or an account where all that money was kept. Next question about money is number four. 
And this is a little bit of a long question, but I appreciate the sentiments of it, so I want to read the whole thing. It says, I have complete faith in our elders about how they distribute the church's funds. I love to give at Lakeside, and I would just say amen to that. I love to give at Lakeside because I know the money will be put to good use. I am curious, however, about whether the Bible gives any guidance as to whether a given function of the church should be funded by the planned, and I'm afraid I put planned, I'm sorry, but the planned, I left an N out, didn't I? The planned church budget, a special contribution to the church, or independent of the church budget. Now, I appreciate that this person has well-placed faith in the elders. I do, too. I never worry about how the church's funds are being used because I watch how they're being used, and then I also have been in on some discussions about how the funds are to be used. And these are godly and wise men who make these decisions. But let's ask the biblical question, How should we approach the difference between things that are funded directly by the church budget and then some things that Christians may support otherwise? We've already read 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 about the authorization of having the church budget. We could consult 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 9, which says that our giving is to be cheerful. It's to be not begrudging giving. We should give because we're heartily giving or we're happy to give. And we can read many passages about how Christians donate to the work of the church as a free will offering and that that is the only means of supporting the work of the church. You will remember that we do not, and we talked about that this morning in our class, that we don't support the work of the church through bake sales or car washes or appealing to people out in the world for money as we often see religious folks begging on TV to get money from people who are watching and they say, if you send us money, then God is going to give you such and such amount of money and The Bible makes no such promises. So that's the way the money is raised. But I can think of cases, and I suppose you can too, where the elders might encourage us to participate in various good works and not support it directly out of the church budget as it stands at the moment. Or we might have a special contribution in order to fund a thing like that. Let me give you an example. Last year we had PTP Spark. Do you remember that? And that arose as an unexpected need. I'm going to say that there are unexpected needs that come up that sometimes require a different kind of funding, and then there are expected needs. And all of this is through the free will offerings of Christians. There's no difference there. But there may be a difference in how the money is allocated. When Spark came up, it came up, I don't know how many people know this, but it came up because of a tornado. Because a tornado destroyed the fellowship hall at the Jacksonville, Alabama congregation. They were going to host Spark last March. And when they were unable to host it because their fellowship hall got destroyed, we just happened to contact them at the right time and say, we might be interested in hosting a Spark some year. Well, it turns out they needed us right then. And so we did it in March. And that was an unplanned expense. And the church had to meet that need. The budget was not suited for that. Hadn't been planned out. That was a big expense. And so the elders asked for a special contribution. But then there also might be expected needs that the elders in their prudence foresee coming up and yet say, while we would like for Christians to participate in this, we endorse this as a good work, it is not fitting in the budget due to the priorities of the budget. Remember, the New Testament authorizes three works of the church. And these are broad and there's some overlap. But the New Testament authorizes three works of the church. Benevolence, Galatians 6 and verse 10, evangelism, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, and edification or the building up of Christians, helping people stay saved. That's Galatians 6, 1 and following and many other passages. But those are the three works. So if the elders are distributing the money to accomplish those three works, then they are well within their rights in using prudence to determine which of those works that could accomplish, which functions could accomplish those three goals are supported from the church budget. And decisions have to be made because the budget is only so big. The budget can only cover so many different things. So the elders might say, here's something we approve of. We'd be happy for people to do it, but we're not going to support it fully or maybe at all out of the church budget. An example is lads to leaders. The elders encourage any families who would like to participate in that good expedient for helping train leaders in the church. 
but to cover all of the travel expenses and the hotel expenses for everybody who goes is beyond what the budget can bear given the priorities that have already been placed on it. Or we might have a case where somebody comes to the elders and says, here is a young man who wants to go to preaching school. Could the church support this man? And the elders may say, we just don't have it in the budget. We realize that it's a year from now and he wants to go, but we're supporting all the missionaries we can. Some other people have already asked for support. We just can't fund that right now, but we could support it in another way. Not only could we pray for that person, but we might even put up a flyer and say, here's a person who wants to go to preaching school and we would like to support him. We can't out of the church budget, but if anybody wants to support him, we would recommend it. A church might even volunteer to oversee his funds. That is to say, if people want to support him, we would invite them to send their checks to this congregation and we'll have a bank account for him and we'll support his work even if it can't be supported out of the church budget. I've heard of cases where some parents wanted to set up a basketball goal or some kind of athletic equipment to facilitate fellowship amongst the teenagers. And the elders of a congregation, I I don't know about this happening here, but the elders of the congregation might say, we'd be happy for there to be a basketball goal on our property because we recognize that when kids get together and play, a lot of good things happen. But we don't want to fund the purchase of the basketball goal from the church budget. So if parents want to buy a goal and set it up, then we would be all for that. I'm just giving examples of the kinds of things where we have a limited budget and the elders have to make judgments about which things will be covered from that budget or which things Christians might fund themselves separately from that budget. And I would suggest they fall into the categories of unexpected needs and expected needs. And in either case, it may be that the priorities of the budget dictate that something is or is not covered by the budget. Next question. Let's turn over to Ephesians 5 or 4, verse 25. The question is, is it always wrong to lie? What if someone could be killed unless you lie? What about Rahab's lie? Let me say at the outset that the Bible is absolutist against lying. And when I say it's absolutist, that means the Bible says do not lie, and that is absolute and there are no exceptions. The Bible never approves of lying under any circumstance. The Bible just says, don't lie. And I've produced a number of passages on the screen which tell you not to lie. And I'll just notice a few of those. For example, in Proverbs 6, 16 and 17, we read where the Proverbs writer says that God hates a lying tongue. Or we might think of Colossians 3, 9, which simply says, do not lie to one another. Or we might think of Ephesians 4.25, which says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood. So can I have some falsehood? Could I have a little bit of it? No, it says, lay it aside. Speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And of course, Revelation 21.8 says that the liars will not be saved. And you could read any number of these other passages which contrast the nature of God and Christ with the nature of the devil and his work. And in John 8, 44, Jesus said that the devil is the father of what? The father of lies. So if we lie, as Jesus was accusing some of those people in his context of doing, we're following what the devil teaches, not following what God teaches. So the Bible is absolutely against lying. I fully recognize that there are some times when it is quite uncomfortable to avoid lying, And I fully realize that there are times when there are severe consequences to either telling the truth or staying quiet. But nonetheless, I cannot stand anywhere else other than where the Bible stands on the issue of lying. But now let's address one of the main objections, which I'm going to call the murderer at the door scenarios. And people will often bring this up in connection with the Holocaust. So let's say the Nazis are coming through your neighborhood and you are hiding some innocent Jews in your house. So here comes the Gestapo, and they knock on your door. And the question is, are you hiding any Jews in your house? And you could, of course, adapt this illustration to a variety of other circumstances, but they'll often involve the Nazis and the Jews. And the Bible says, do not lie. How do we deal with someone who might say, well, you gotta lie. You just gotta lie, you know, because of the circumstance. And Rahab lied, let's say. And the Bible does, uh, does condone 
Rahab as a good person. But the Bible never condones Rahab's lying. In other words, the Bible, I shouldn't say really good person. The Bible said that Rahab did well in accepting the spies and working to help them, but doesn't ever actually condone her lying. You can read about her in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse, what is that in Hebrews 11? Verse 31 and James 2 and verse 25. So she is commended for helping the spies, but she's not commended for helping them in by, by way of lying. That would go against all the other passages that we've been saying. But let's look at these four or five points about the murderer at the door scenario. First of all, it's extreme and highly unusual. That doesn't mean we shouldn't address it, but it's highly unusual. So we should watch out in circumventing or opposing everything the Bible says about lying generally over one case that's actually highly unusual. Then in the next place, we do not have to tell everything we know in order to avoid telling a lie. We had a discussion this morning in our sermon about the transfiguration regarding discretion. And there are times when we don't tell everything we know because it would be hurtful. There's no reason to do that. We need to have speech this with grace, seasoned with salt, Colossians 4, 6. And sometimes that means keeping our mouth shut and being slow to speak, as James 1, 19 through 21 says. And the wise Christian will keep a lot of things to himself or to herself. So we can be honest without always telling everything we know. Sometimes honesty requires we do tell what we know. That would be a deep study, and we just don't have time to go into that tonight. But in the next place, truth is not a murderer. If I tell somebody the truth, the truth didn't kill anybody. A murderer is a murderer. A true statement doesn't murder anybody. Then in the fourth place, I would suggest outcomes are unpredictable. We don't actually know with apodictic certainty what's going to happen after we tell the truth to somebody who's at the door. And let me just read an example. This, this was very helpful from a German philosopher who in, the, in the 18th century named Immanuel Kant. You've heard of him. And maybe you're saying to yourself, I can't believe we're reading from him tonight. But we're going to read a statement where he addressed this exact scenario. And he wasn't saying this from a biblical point of view, although he claimed to be a Christian. He's saying it just from a common sense point of view that we can't predict what's going to happen when we tell somebody the truth. And he was talking about this exact situation where a murderer comes to the door, and he's saying you can't lie because it's wrong to lie. Now listen to what he says. If by telling a lie you have in fact hindered someone who was even now planning a murder, then you are legally responsible for all the consequences that might result therefrom. But if you have adhered strictly to the truth, then public justice cannot lay a hand on you whatever the unforeseen consequence might be. It is indeed possible that after you have honestly answered yes to the murderer's question as to whether the intended victim is in the house, the latter went out unobserved and thus eluded the murderer so that the deed would not have come about. However, if you told a lie and said that the intended victim was not in the house and he has actually, though unbeknownst to you, gone out with the result that by so doing he has been met by the murderer and thus the deed has been perpetrated, then in this case you may justly be accused as having caused his death. For if you had told the truth as best you knew it, then the murderer might perhaps have been caught by neighbors who came running while he was searching the house for his intended victim, and thus the deed might have been prevented. Therefore, whoever tells a lie, regardless of how good his intentions may be, must answer for the consequences resulting therefrom. One more point. And that is, a slippery slope threatens. If we say to ourselves, I will lie to the guy at the door who wants to murder somebody, then we have entered into consequential reasoning where we decide what is right and wrong based not on the principles of God's Word, but based upon consequences that may result. How bad does a prospective consequence have to be to justify sinning? Let me just ask that again. How bad does an intended consequence have to be in order to justify sinning? Suppose a person comes and he just wants to not kill a person in your house, but he would just like to beat up somebody in the house. Could we lie then? What if he really just wants to give a harsh reprimand to somebody in the house? Would it be all right for us to lie then? Suppose this is just a person someone in your house finds distasteful. Could we lie then? 
You see, once we depart from what the Bible says, forbidding lying, and we begin to say, I'll lie if it seems like I really, really need to. Well, then we've entered into a realm where we have become the people who get to determine what's right and wrong and not God. And so we must always base what we do on the principles of God's word and not on the consequences that we foresee. You might say, well, it worked out pretty well for Rahab when she lied. She accomplished something good with that. Well, a lot of times we accomplish what we want to by lying. Otherwise, we wouldn't lie. But that doesn't make it right, does it? And let's just think about some consequences. And I'll leave the question in just a moment. But suppose a man has been having an affair. He's been cheating on his wife. It would be, in one sense, preferable for him to lie about the affair because it might keep the family together. But does that make it right? Well, I'm bringing up cases like this just to say it's very arbitrary to say, okay, my consequences meet the standard for justifying lying, when what we should do is just say, I'm going to stick with what God says. And God says, don't lie. I remember I was teaching about lying in another church somewhere. That was the Bible class topic for that night. And one of the elders in the church, this is nowhere where I've been the local preacher, okay? But one of the elders in the church raised his hand and said, if I were commanded to lie as a military person, I would lie and then plan to repent of it later. Think about that for a moment. Is that going to be sincere repentance? When someone says, I'm planning to do the sin, and I'll just plan to repent of it later. And we cannot stand anywhere else other than where the Bible stands on every ethical issue. I believe we're out of time. We have some wonderful questions. Let's just do one more because it will function as offering the invitation. Let's go to question six. And it says, when we get to heaven, are we going to know about those who are not there? How can we be happy in heaven if we are aware that some of our loved ones are not there? In answer to that question, I want to read from 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Because it will tell us that heaven is a place that is undefiled. That is, there is nothing in heaven that would mess it up. It's a perfect place. Revelation 21 and verse 4 says that there is no sorrow or tears or death or pain in heaven. And here's what Peter says about that heavenly home. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God uh, through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. The saved will have no sorrow in that undefiled place. And they'll be focused on what is in heaven and not what is absent from heaven. If you read Revelation 21 and 22, and I would urge you to do that tonight before you go to bed, that will be an encouragement to you to read about heaven from those two chapters. When you read about it, you will see that the people who are there are focused on the Lord and on the Lord's people. Those are the two things. Those are the two main attractions about going to heaven, is that you get to be with God and you get to be with God's people, and that will be the focus of our attention, worshiping Him, and enjoying fellowship with our brethren. What about the people who are not there? I don't know how God's going to handle this, but God has some mechanism for doing that tear wiping, for wiping all of the sorrow away. And while indeed, during this life, one of the great distresses, Peter talks about the distresses and discomforts in the passage we just read. One of our greatest distresses is the fact that we have loved ones who are lost. But that's precisely those those discouragements and those distresses... That is precisely what is done away with when we go to heaven. And so that gives us a great motivation to go there. If we're sad about lost loved ones, the place to go is heaven. Not because we want those people to be lost, but because God's going to take care of all of our sorrows. We're going to do what we can to save them. While we're on earth, we're going to pray for them. We're going to plead with them. We're pleading with you tonight if you're lost. But we want to go to heaven. The fact that other people are lost doesn't mean we have to be. And we're going to be enraptured with the will of God being done. You know, Revelation 5, verses 1 through 11, 
discusses the voices of the martyrs, the saved Christians who were martyred for their faith. They were killed. And what question are they asking there in Revelation 5? They're asking, how long, O Lord? In other words, how long until your justice is going to be meted out on the people who are wicked? That's a just question. Because what one is asking in that case is, Lord, I want your will to be done. Will you do it? When will you do it? And our focus in heaven is going to be on praising God for His will being done. And that includes His justice. And so we will be, while not wanting anyone to be lost, while not celebrating the lostness of our loved ones, our friends, our family, not hoping that they're lost by any stretch, but we will have such a great appreciation for God's will in heaven that that will overshadow everything else. We need to be building and developing our appreciation for His will while we're on earth. Because while we're on earth is our chance to make a decision about whether we'll go to heaven or not. And maybe somebody here tonight needs to obey the gospel. Can we assist you in doing that? Or maybe you need to be restored to faithfulness. We would love to assist you. Or maybe you want the prayers of the church for some other reason. Come now, as together we stand and sing. This is out of the New King James. But sanctify the